Hello, my name is James Markey, and many of you know me as the bass trombonist with the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and I'd like to welcome you to this next video collaboration with Virtuosity Musical Instruments. Now, if you want to know more about the gear that I play on, the mouthpiece line that I have with Christian Griego or my Edwards B502i, you can find that out at the links right up here. Now, this video is in direct response to a video series which Virtuosity and I had done back about a year ago where we introduced our Griego mouthpiece line. And in that, I talked a little bit about the technique for playing in the low register on the bass trombone. But many of you have come forward with additional questions and, and wanting a follow-up video, and this video is in direct response to that. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how we approach the low register on a bass trombone or on a trombone or on a low brass instrument, really. When we're talking about low register on a low brass instrument, either trombone or bass trombone, I like to keep it simple at, at thinking of really three key things. One, you want a concept. Two, you want a process to implement that concept. And third, we need patience. So as far as the concept is concerned, I can relate my own story. When I first started my lessons with Joseph Alessi, one of the first things we approached was low register. And Mr. Alessi introduced me to a recording I'd never heard of before, Tommy Pedersen's All My Friends Are Trombone Players. And in that recording, there's one of the tracks, uh, Josephine, features George Roberts. And I'd never heard this, I'd never heard him. And so Joe said to me, you know, you want to sound like a great bass trombonist when you play in your low register. And so take a listen to this. And when I took it home and I listened to it, I'd never heard anything like it. What I realized is that in retrospect, we can't develop a great sound on the low register, in the low register, if we don't know what a great low register can sound like. So that's crucial. So with the ubiquitousness of proprietary streaming services like Apple Music and Google Play, Spotify, um, you've got SoundCloud, let alone YouTube, and all the CDs that we can listen to, there is no shortage of resources for us to get this idea. But as we're listening to this idea, it's really helpful for us to keep a basic concept in mind, such as, I call it the sound pyramid. And I like to say that every great sound in the orchestra has three key parts. You've got warmth, core, and brilliance. And that applies to the low register as well. And I call it the sound pyramid because it's shaped like this. And at the base of that pyramid, you've got warmth. That's the part of the sound that gives you a great big hug. We bass trombonists tend to love that part of the sound. But you've also, at the middle of the pyramid, you've got core. That's what gives a sound carrying power. And that instead of just brushing up against you, it really goes into you. And then you've got brilliance. And brilliance is the part of the sound that, that gives you excitement. And if we play with a soft sound, you know, maybe we're we're really heavy on the warm side. If we play with a really uh, exciting sound, we're heavy on the brilliance. But since music really speaks often where words can't, I'm just gonna demonstrate a few things. So for the kind of sound where we're a really warm kind of sound, a great example would be a Bordoni down an octave. But if we're going for something louder, something more brilliant, you know, a great example would be something like Ein Heldenleben. And there's got a lot more brilliance there. So the idea of using that sound pyramid is a great way to provide a quantifiable assessment of what we're actually hearing, just to put our finger on what it is that we're hearing. So that really is the first part of just having an idea in your head. And as you're listening, to have some kind of reference that you can pay attention to, to process what it is that you're actually hearing. That can be really helpful. Now, the second part of developing your low register is the process. And this is really important because different processes can work for different people. Sometimes something as simple as hear the sound that you want to get and make that sound is enough. And for some people, that's great. For some people, that is grossly inadequate because you might even be watching this video and saying, yeah, I hear myself getting a great sound and I'm not getting it and I don't know what to do. The truth is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting to get a different result. 
So if you want to make a change, then sometimes you just have to make a change. But that change can come about different ways. In the case of my work with my teacher, he not only had me listen to Mr. Roberts on Josephine, but he also gave me some specific advice. And he told me to flatten my chin, because he noticed that my chin wasn't flat, to flatten my chin and imagine putting the weight on the bottom lip. And that for me was helpful. But I want to take a step back and sort of understand or help explain in the best terms that I can why that was helpful. Anytime you're developing a process, you want to understand what it is that you're hoping your process will do. When we go higher, our aperture, that opening between our lips, it gets smaller. And when we go lower, that aperture gets larger. And generally speaking, when we're playing with a really great low register sound, it's because we're continuing to allow that aperture to get larger and larger and larger. And that can happen through any number of ways. And I'm going to, to give you just a couple ways. One, our lip position changes. It just naturally changes. When I play a middle B flat, my lips are set so that my bottom lip is a little bit behind my top lip. And you can see it when I set up to play and come down. That's my middle, middle B flat. But when I go for a low B flat, my bottom lip starts to come out. It starts to come out from behind and it starts to come forward. Like this. And that's the basic position for my low B flat. And that continues. When Mr. Olesi gave me that advice to flatten my chin, it's because he noticed that when I was buckling my chin, that's actually going to impact my ability to be stable as my bottom lip comes out. And uh, I can give a great example of that. So Mr. Olesi noticed that my chin was buckling. And I want to explain what that does. As our lip comes out, when we buckle our chin, it pushes our lip up against. You can see it. And that pushes our lip up. Now, can a person play in the low register with a buckled chin and get as good sound? Yes, absolutely. It's possible. In fact, there are a lot of people in the world that do. But is it an ideal or an effective way of doing it? Not really, because what we want is stability, and that flesh is always going to be changing. When we flatten our chin, that allows our stability to be with our jaw, and it's the jaw which makes the change. And watch what happens, the difference between buckling the chin and the second way of keeping the chin flat, and you can see the difference in jaw motion. When we buckle the chin, the chin stays back, but when we flatten the chin, the jaw comes forward. That flattening of the chin is really, really helpful, and I would say really crucial to establishing a reliable base on which you can anchor your low register. So when we're talking about what we do here, understand that this is not necessarily scientific. This is anecdotal. This is not only based on my own experience and what I do, but also what I've seen in other professionals and also other students of what tends to work. So this is the best guess is what's going on inside. Now understand, I mentioned the process. There are so many different ways that we can look at this process. And a great example of that is I use the terminology. I, I like to focus on what the lips are doing, but there are other people that focus on the air and they say, hey, when you go higher, your air points down. And when you go lower, your air points up. What we're talking about are the exact same thing. Because when your lip, when your bottom lip goes behind your top lip to go in the upper register, what does it do? It points the air down. And when your bottom lip comes out to come forward in the low register, what happens? It starts to point the air more forward and even more up. So we're actually talking about the exact same thing, just from different points of view. So as you go through your process and how you're handling this, understand that there are a lot of different ways to approach a very similar process to get the same result, but to look at things in a different way. When we talk about the air doing this, going up and down, 
or whether you're talking about the lip position, we're actually talking about getting the same result and maybe having a slightly different process for doing it, but we're talking about the same basic concept. That's the process that we undergo. The third point is patience. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be patient with yourself and have an intelligent patience. When you're developing something that you don't know how to do, your body just doesn't know how to do it. And you have to have patience to figure that out, but also to figure that out in a smart way. The example I'll use is when I was at Juilliard and I played my tenor trombone, I could play a pedal B flat and I topped out at about a pedal G. That's about as low as I could go. And there was a bass trombonist there named Yossi Itzkevich, and he had a fantastic deep pedal register, like pedal F, E, E flat. And I once asked him, I said, Yossi, how do you do that? He said, oh, I just pulled my bottom lip out of the mouthpiece. I just thought that was the most absurd sounding thing in the world. Oh, you bottom, pull your bottom lip out of the mouthpiece. Okay, ha ha ha, yeah, sounds great. Well, I just said, you know what? I think I'm gonna try that because what I'm doing isn't working. I seem to keep bottoming out at about a G. It's not a great G. Uh, I'm gonna try it. And so I did. And I said, well, gee, what does it look like to pull my bottom lip out of the mouthpiece? And I experimented. And this is where patience comes into play. So when Yossi said, well, I just pulled my bottom lip out of the mouthpiece, I thought, oh, ha, 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 yeah. He's so easy, so simple. But I decided to try it. And the results were far from perfect. It sounded something like this. And I started laughing because I thought I sounded like a lawnmower. And yet, the fact that it was uncontrolled, I was patient with myself and I kept working. And I started laughing because I thought, this is a chainsaw. There's no way this can work. And yet, there was the seed for developing the deep pedal register to be where it is now. And the explanation to the process is that by actually pulling my bottom lip out of the mouthpiece, I freed up room for the aperture to keep getting larger and larger. Little did I know that as I was going lower into the mouthpiece and pushing my bottom lip forward, I was running out of room. And I can continue to run out of room with my standard armature, even on a bass trombone and even on the bass trombone mouthpiece. And you can hear when I start to run out of room. Yes, my chin is flat. And yes, I'm also running out of room because there's a finite amount of space here. But by doing that Yossi Izkovich version of flattening my bottom lip, I was able to get my bottom lip out of the mouthpiece and slide my mouthpiece up so my top lip winds up being able to vibrate more and more and more. And it looks like this. And you can see how my mouthpiece continues to slide up further and further towards the bottom of my nose and my bottom lip goes further outside the mouthpiece. And developing that alternative amateur required patience. Patience to realize that, yeah, that is something that I actually need to do. I am going to run out of room. And no matter how hard I push my lips into the mouthpiece, I'm not gonna get the result that I want. So what do I need to do? I need patience to develop this alternative embouchure, which allows me to get the sound that I want. Duke Ellington is attributed to having said, if it sounds good, it is good. And I can't imagine a better quote to describe our work in the low register, that if you're getting the kind of sound that you want to get, then you're doing things in the right way that you need to do them, simply because of the space issues that we find. I can't thank uh, one of my colleagues, Blair Bollinger, enough for a little bit of time he spent with me uh, shortly after I started work on bass trombone to help develop fluidity from the extreme pedal register with my altered embouchure to my regular pedal register embouchure. And that just involved doing some exercises and being patient with myself with going from one to the next. They were simple exercises 
of just having me start off with one pedal note with my altered embouchure, breathe through my nose, and play another pedal note with my unaltered embouchure, like this. And then that goes from separating those to actually slurring between the two. And then gradually adding even more slurs. And these exercises really help me develop fluidity so I can get in and out of that register at will. This is the kind of patience that we need to sort out when our body doesn't know how to do something, but understands a concept, to allow the body to figure it out. It's very much like when we learn how to walk. When a child learns how to walk, they take their steps, but they take one step and they fall down. What do they do? They get right back up and they take another step. But the idea is to go step to step. When you've got two parents and one parent's here and the other parent's here and they say, oh, take a step, you know, come to daddy or come to mommy. And the child goes, we say, oh, yay. They don't then take 10 steps back and say, now come to daddy, come to mommy. No, they keep it within this step. And you do it again and again until the child seems to get comfortable. And then you say, oh, let's take a couple steps back and we take three steps now. When we allow ourselves to proceed in our own development in the same way, step by step, we allow ourselves very small points of success. And success begets success. When you succeed at something simple, you can su succeed at something more complicated. You can go step to step to step, and we can see our own growth. Now, do you need a teacher to make this happen? Well, it really depends. What is the role of a teacher? The role of a teacher is to facilitate learning. That's ultimately what it is. And sometimes as teachers, that means that we tell our students exactly what to do. And sometimes it means we guide our students in different ways by demonstrating and allowing our students to pick up. There are different ways that we can go about it. So can you learn this without a teacher? Absolutely. You have to be patient with yourself. But might a good teacher's guidance be helpful with this? Yes, it might. And I hope this video serves to help provide some of that guidance for you in your own work. Now, as we're working on the low register, it's really helpful on the one hand to have exercises, but you can't just play exercises. We wanna play music. That's the whole reason we play these exercises for, is to develop our ability to play music really, really well. And so finding smart music as you're developing your low register is really important. One of the resources that my teacher pointed me to was Alan Ostrander's Studies for the F Attachment Trombone. And it's a great resource that takes you progressively a little bit lower and a little bit lower into the single valve register, which, truth of it, that's so crucial not only for tenor trombonists, but bass trombonists as well. And so here is an example from Alan Ostrander's Studies for the F Attachment and Bass Trombone.
So I hope you found this video helpful. If you have, give it a like, and you can always email me with questions. Uh, my email is available on my Instagram page. Uh, you can also uh, email Virtuosity if there are other things you want to talk about, especially email Virtuosity if there are other videos that you want to see them put up. So thank you for watching. Have a great day and good luck and happy practicing. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you have, give it a like. If you didn't, don't give it a dislike. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, you gotta figure out what to do with my hands. I wanna put them in my pockets, but then I don't wanna so put them in my pockets. And I'm gonna do that again because I ran out of air at the end. At the end. So, one more time. You should stop saying sorry, just go. <laughs> and so here's one of those studies from Alan Ostrander's uh, what's it called? If you, if it sounds good, uh, I know what I want to say here. Ah, uh, where can I empty my water? Just on oh, the floor? Anywhere is totally anywhere? great. Okay. As long as it's not in your water cup. Okay. Yeah. I, I will try to avoid the water cup. Oh. <laughs>